Good morning. Thank you. Thank you for uh, joining the session this morning to learn a little more about intellectual property rights in the age of generative AI. My name is Melissa Harrop. I'm the Senior Vice President and Chief Counsel for North America for Mondelez International. We make yummy products like Oreo and Chips Ahoy cookies, Cadbury chocolate, and Sour Patch Kids. That said, the views I'm going to share today are my own and not necessarily that of my employer. So on Monday, I jumped into a rideshare to get from the airport to the hotel. As you do, I exchange pleasantries with the driver and he asked me, so what brings you to Las Vegas? That's a loaded question. And I said, well, I'm here to attend a conference on artificial intelligence. And he said to me, huh, that's interesting. Can I ask you a question? I said, sure. He goes, that AI thing, can it write something for me? I said, yes, it could write something for me. He goes, oh. And if what I want to write is two and a half thousand words long. Can it do that too? And I said, yes, you can put in parameters. And so I said to him, have you heard about OpenAI and ChatGBT? And he said, no. So when we pulled up to a stoplight, he got out his notebook and said, so what do I do? I Google OpenAI, ChatGPT. He said, yes. And I paused and I said to him, so what do you want to write? He said, oh, I'm a pastor. I have a sermon to write for church this Sunday. <laughs> and that got me thinking. So believe it or not, in June this year in Germany, there was an entire church service written by ChatGBT and delivered by avatars. And that makes you think and pause, right? The impact that generative AI is having on our society and culture is extraordinary. And whether that impact is positive or negative is really going to come down to us. What are we going to do with it? How are we going to leverage it? So think about the news and what's been happening. In June, and Authors Guild wrote an open letter to the leaders of generative AI urging the Gen I leadership to consider the rights of authors in the context of training data. Ask our consent. Compensate us. And this has become a really fundamental component of the debate around the use of copyrighted materials in the context of training generative AI models. We'll talk a little bit about that. Yesterday, we heard from Band Labs and about their program that can democratize music creation. It puts the power of creativity, things that only studios and labs had, into the hands of people from a broad range of socioeconomic backgrounds. We saw Wonder Dynamics. How amazing was that? Democratizing visual effects, again, making it available for everybody. So you can see from the Authors Guild to the democratization of creativity, AI can, is causing quite a considerable amount of discourse in our society, in public, about what is good and what is not so good. So in the last year, there has been an extensive debate 
and you've been reading about it in the papers. I want to share with you um, two questions that we're going to dive into that have really bubbled up through the court cases, through the Authors Guild, through others that have been concerned about uh, intellectual property rights and generative AI. And these are the two topics we're going to talk about. Should the output of generative AI be protected by copyright? The second question is, should the use of copyrighted materials in training Gen I models be considered copyright infringement? Before we delve into these questions, I do want to ground us in four principles of intellectual property. And my apologies if I'm going over some basic things, but it's really important that we're all grounded. The first thing is intellectual property rights are a bundle of rights. So when people talk about IPR, they're really talking about things like copyright, which protects literary works, music, architecture. They're talking about patents that protect inventions, trademarks, which are source identifiers, so IP is not this homogenous thing. We have to consider it in the context of the rights that they are. And we're going to be focusing on copyright today. Intellectual property rights do not protect ideas, but rather the expression of the idea. So I'll give you an example. Let's say I take out my paintbrushes and paints and I paint a sunset beautiful sunset with lots of colors. I own the copyright in that painting. I do not own any intellectual property rights in the idea of a sunset that is painted. This is important. This is an important policy position that we've taken as a society to ensure we don't wrap up ideas tightly. Everyone can access ideas. The next thing, fourth principle, is that we give creators and inventors exclusive rights for a limited period of time to encourage creativity and inventiveness. After which point in time, when that time elapses, it goes into the public domain. So some things you may be very familiar with is think about generic drugs. We have patented drugs. When that patents elapse and when they run out of time, they enter the public domain. We can access it and generic companies can make it. And it's similar for copyrighted work. Now what's really interesting is that this principle and foundational principle is actually embedded in our US constitution and it's in our Copyright Act. Even more interesting for those who are history buffs, if you want to find out the source of that foundation principle, it's from a 1710 statute called the Statute of Anne. And that statute came about, this was passed in 1710 by their British Parliament, because of a technological revolution that had everybody up in arms at the time. Think about this in the 1600s. And you know what that technological revolution was? The Gutenberg printing press. Before the Statue of Van, authors had no rights. So this comes back all the way through to us now to generative AI. The US copyright, so if you create, so my sunset that I've painted, I've created, I get six exclusive rights. I get the right to reproduce the work, prepare derivative work so I could, you know, make a change to it and still have ownership of that copyrighted work. I can distribute copies, perform, display, and digitally transmit. And so think about those authors 
that we talk about before, who were up in arms. And that Authors Guild letter, by the way, was signed by over 10,000 writers, including Margaret Atwood and James Patterson. This is a serious social issue. These are the rights they're talking about that they feel are being trampled upon. So to give you a sense of the kind of tsunami of activity that's happening at the moment, I'm going to share this timeline, and I apologize, it's a bit of an eye chart. It works. There we go. These are some major events that have happened since January 23, January this year, in, in the space in the United States around intellectual property rights and AI. I won't take you through this in detail. We'll focus on the colored dots. So the orange dots are litigation. For the most part, the litigation surrounds artists who are upset about their copyrighted works being used in training data sets. The green dots are the listening sessions that the copyright office is having. They're having them on AI and visual arts, AI and music and sound recordings. They're all publicly available, incredibly interesting to, to have a listen to if you have time. The blue dots are the Senate Judiciary Committee hearings that have been taking place on AI and copyright law, AI and patent law. The red dots, Supreme Court decisions, an important one that just was, came down on May 18, which was the Warhol and Goldsmith case, a case about fair use. And the gray, June 30, Authors Guild open letter to the CEOs. June 4, July 14, SAG after strike. All of these things are happening in our society, in our community, and it's all around IP and AI. One case that's interesting that I wanted to, to raise is Thaler and Pelmeter. Does anyone know about Stephen Thaler? No? <laughs> so, so Stephen, um, this filing on January 10 relates to um, his dispute with the Copyright Office. He asked a generative, he created a piece of artwork called A Recent Entrance to Paradise with a generative AI model and he submitted it to the Copyright Office for protection. And the Copyright Office denied that, saying that the output of a generative AI model should not be afforded copyright protection because there's no human authorship. So I have a question for you all. Who thinks, with a raise of hands, who thinks that Gen AI, so if you create something in mid-journey, who thinks that should be protected by copyright? Okay, so herein lies the reason why from society we have differences of opinion of why that should be. So the Copyright Acts protects original works of authorship. An author appears in the Constitution, in the Copyright Clause, and it appears in the Copyright Act, and it is interpreted to mean that author means you are a human. So when there was that case about the dis copyright dispute regarding the monkey who took a selfie. Does anyone know that one? It's an amusing case. Monkeys cannot give you, their works of art are not protected by copyright. Just reiterating the fact that it's humans that are afforded that protection. So if we take this photo, for example, and I took the photo, it's flowers from my garden. I have the copyright in the photo. The Copyright Office has issued some instruction on what would be protected by copyright. And the photo is protected by copyright. If I was to use AI to change the color of the background and I went to register the copyright, 
That is called, that's a de minimis application of AI, that is fine. However, if I use mid-journey or some other generative AI model to create additional flowers to put in that vase, that would not be protected. So then the question is, for those of you who raised your hand about, you know, can or should uh, generative AI outputs be protected by copyright, one question you may be asking, well, they, they creates, right? The AI creates. And there is a, a quote from a scientist, Dijkstra. I'm sure many of you will know Dijkstra's algorithm. Um, he, he solved the shortest um, distance algorithm. It's used in Google Maps um, and network routing. In one of his, um, his essays, he was commenting on Turing and said, whether machines can think is about as relevant as a question of whether submarines can swim. And I think we need to hold that in our thought when we think about creativity and what it is as a society we want copyright to protect. The next question, is the use of copyrighted materials in training Gen AI models copyright infringement? Who thinks that it should be considered copyright infringement to scrape the web, use the materials? Okay, again, a portion of people raised their hand, a portion did not. There's a lot of debate here. So who, what are the two different sides arguing? The Gen AI company, the generative AI companies are arguing that actually this is an example of fair use. The use of copyrighted materials is significantly transformative, that it falls, falls within the first um, element of fair use, which is a defense against copyright infringement, and that is the purpose and character of the use. The creative community is saying, no, that's not the case, that you are wholesale infringing my copyright by scraping the web and using it to train these extensive models. So you can see the debate raging, and we, we won't really know, um, we've got a number of cases that are still underway, and we won't know what the outcomes are of that. But the one thing we do need to ensure is that we, is that we are mindful of the fact of the human aspect of why we want to encourage creativity. We also want to leverage the amazing possibilities of generative AI. What it can do for the good of society is unlimited. So how do we balance those two? And I want to close and wrap up this session with really three points. The first is Congress really needs to take a lead on this issue. There is a school of thinking that copyright law can cope with generative AI. Hey, it coped with photography. It coped with the Gutenberg press. I'm sorry, this is very, very different. It is incredibly nuanced. We need to, them to step in and really address the issue. For example, could we consider learning rights, special IP rights that we can think about giving artists fair compensation, ability to consent, give them credit, and in return tech companies can use the data without fear of litigation. The second point, each of us plays an important role in ensuring that AI is developed and deployed in an ethical and responsible manner, keeping humans at the center. There's one point that I wanna make here is, please resist the urge of anthropomorphizing AI. We know what it does, right? It tokenizes, vectorizes, applies complex Bayesian probabilistic model, and it spits out an output. However seductive that output it is, 
It's a computation. And we are wired as humans to anthropomorphize things. Think about the doorbot. Do you remember the doorbot that was in the initial session? The doorbot, um, the child said, what, do you remember what the child said? What do you think about doorbot? Oh, he's friendly, he's a good boy. We've got to resist that because that's really key. But finally, and I need to wrap up, <laughs> I am really optimistic that as a society, we can work together. There are companies like Band Labs and other companies that are really ensuring and putting artists at the center, humans at the center of this amazing technology so that we don't lose that in the context of what this technology delivers. So thank you for your time. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs> <laughs>